Aloha and welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Lynette Cruz, your host. Happy to have you here. It's been a while, I think, since I've taped with anyone, but we're lucky today because we have Dr. Keanu Sai as our guest today and, um, and some really interesting discussion. I think everyone will find it particularly appropriate considering all the, the kinds of uh, words that are flying around lately about crimes, uh, what constitutes a crime, and in this case today, Keanu's going to be telling us a story, the Hawaiian story, and talking in, uh, and sharing a little bit about denationalization and genocide. So certainly something I want to know about because I know like ze zero, like most people. They think they know. I thought I knew, but maybe I don't. Aloha. Hey, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> what's going on? Tell us the story. Well, when you, th the issue of genocide is now coming to the forefront being an extension of uh, war crimes. Yeah. And, and these words, war crimes and, and genocide, are pretty shocking. They're kind of, it's quite hard hitting when you first hear it, like war crime in Hawaii. And as the dust began to settle, people start to then feel comfortable with the word war crime because they understand what is a war crime. So war crime is not where you have to be at war and you gotta kill each other, okay? When a country is occupied, even without resistance, that occupation brings in what is called humanitarian law. Okay? And humanitarian law is very different from human rights law. So the ultimate difference between both is humanitarian law is the laws of occupation and how it protects non-combatants, like civilians. You know? uh, human rights law are people with rights, universal rights, universally recognized rights, like a right to life, right to health. Those are human rights which speak to a time when you're not at war. Yeah? So at some times, at some point, um, some human rights can actually get suspended during occupations, which is humanitarian law. So even though you have a right to a fair trial, uh, under humanitarian law during occupation, that right can be temporarily suspended based upon some type of military necessity that needs to be shown. Right Now, if there is no military necessity, then the right to a fair trial is not necessarily a human right, that's actually a right secured under humanitarian law, Article 147 of the Geneva Convention. So you see some overlapping between human rights when you're not at war and humanitarian rights when you're at war or when a place is occupied, a country's occupied. So what what makes it so that these terms are now being used? Uh, I was going to ask you, yeah. how is it that, that these distinctions were not made in the past? People are always talking about genocide, especially genocide toward Hawaiians. And I always, was, I always wondered what that meant, right. aside from like they're trying to kill us all or have killed right. us all. Right. And well, genocide, um, actually, the way it's used today, uh, in most cases, it's a human right. Right, which means there's no occupation taking place or armed conflict. Okay, so when people talk about genocide today, they are speaking it through the lens that Hawaii is a part mm. of the United States. There is no occupation, but now there's an argument that genocide took place amongst Native Hawaiians okay, in particular. Now, people have not necessarily been able to explain that or to articulate that, and I think they weren't able to explain it because they didn't really understand what is genocide. Now for myself, I have to admit, I didn't understand what was genocide. And I took it at, at, at face value. Geno, okay, meaning the nation or tribe, side is to kill. So basically genocide is like homicide, right? To kill a human, genocide is to kill a race, right? That's at face value. Mm. That was not correct when I looked into it. Now that is, correct if you're looking at it through human rights law, right? A massive killing, that's genocide, okay? But what I needed to do was to understand where did that term come from? And the term was first coined by a professor named Raphael uh, Lemkin, okay, in 1944. And he had it in his book regarding the Axis powers during World War II and the occupations. When he coined the word genocide, he clearly explained that genocide is not massive killings, but genocide is systemic. It's a national pattern that could lead to killings. 
that could lead to uh, dispossessions. So it's more of the killing of a nation, which is a country, right? But it could also be applied to the killing of a particular race, right? So I began to really look into this issue. And what I found very interesting is that uh, Professor Lemkin, he was speaking about genocide during war. So that's not coming from a human rights perspective. He was speaking about genocide from a humanitarian perspective, humanitarian law. And that's what I understood. That's what I know. I know humanitarian law. And he began to do a, 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 a not a survey, but an expose of the occupations that were taking place by Germany during World War II. Okay? And he did an expose on Luxembourg, on Belgium. And what he was showing was genocide, he said, was equal to the war crime of denationalization. Now, at that time, genocide was not recognized. In fact, he made that word up <laughs> in 1944. But he, he made it up to reflect a pattern of oppression, right? So he says there's basically two, two phases of genocide. The pattern of a particular state is destroyed, and the second, second phase is the replacement of that national pattern of the oppressor, okay? So what you have is a, it's a, a, a system that basically is placed over a system that was destroyed. And that system includes administrative, judicial, courts, um, economics, currency, you know. So you're talking about a national pattern, not just a particular policy, a national pattern. And once that national pattern by the oppressor is placed within that territory or that state, then issues can arise, such as uh, massive killings, um, uh, banning of languages in the schools, um, what he termed Germanization. Um, you also so have Americanization. Uh, and, and gotcha. Exactly. So like in our case, for Hawaii, it would be Americanization, not Germanization. So, so, so genocide, from, from my uh, understanding, is it, it, it basically is synonymous in its totality with denationalization. And denationalization, by definition, is, is where you are obliterating any memory of some national character, right? So if you're in Luxembourg and you have a Luxembourg culture and national identity, Germanization will try to replace that with a German thought. So when you have people talking or thinking German, through the courts, through the laws. In that language, definitely. Yeah. So, denationalization and <coughs> um, that, that happens when a place is being occupied by another country. Well, it, it's, it doesn't happen all the time because denationalization is a war crime. So you can occupy a country during war, which is legal, right, because international mm -hmm. law regulates war, but you don't necessarily denationalize while you're occupying. Now, if you're occupying territory and you now impose your own national pattern within that territory and you implement certain policies based upon that national pattern, that's denationalization. So what we have in Hawaii, our, Hawaii's history is, is, is unique. Yeah? And as people are starting to understand Hawaii's history, they're starting to see the broader consequences. So clearly, roughly, we can just say, um, to, to build a premise here, the Hawaiian kingdom was a recognized independent state in the 19th century. There is no doubt, it was. In fact, the Permanent Court of Arbitration's arbitral tribunal in Larson, Lance Larson versus the Hawaiian kingdom, in its arbitration award in 2001, which was published in the International Law Reports, specifically stated, that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom existed as an independent state, recognized as such by the United States of America, Great Britain, and various other states. Now that term independence, uh, again, it's terminology, which is very important. When a state is recognized as being independent, as was verified by the Permanent Court of Arbitration's tribunal, independent, by definition, 
is a political independence. What it means is the United States in the 19th century, along with Great Britain and various other states, recognized that only Hawaiian law existed over Hawaiian territory. So to use the terminology of Professor Lemkin, what they recognized was the Hawaiian national pattern. Yeah? Its laws, its institutions, its currency, its trade practices and everything. And that independence means that when Americans from the United States or British from Great Britain or French from France come to Hawaii, they are subject to that system, right? And that's what's called independence. Many people today use it wrong, mm. the term independence. They think it, they have to advocate <coughs> for independence. You know, so and I, I hear- I think they also consider independence that has to do with government, just yeah. government itself without the pattern, yeah. the national pattern. It's a national pattern. So the reason why people use the word independence today wrong is they operate from the false assumption or the false premise that Hawaii is not its own independent state, but it wishes to become one. You know, so it's more of an aspiration. Well, we're talking 19th century now. Hawaii was recognized as an independent state. So that national pattern was clearly recognized throughout the world by other countries. So again, when their citizens come to Hawaii, they're under that system subject to those laws. Just like when a Hawaiian subject would travel, like King Kalakaua, when he traveled and his uh, um, diplomatic group went to Washington, they knew that they were under American law. They were not under Hawaiian law when you're in America. And when you have an American in Hawaii visiting or a diplomat, they're under Hawaiian law, right? Now they may have diplomatic immunity, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, they're not under the law itself of that country, okay? or that their laws would apply. Because if you apply your laws of one state into the territory of another state, that's a direct violation of independence. Okay? So in the United States occupied Iraq in 2003, they did not bring in American law to administer, uh, to, for the administration to take place uh, in Iraq under the laws of occupation. So the coalition provisional authority that was created as a military government they administered Iraqi law, not American law. Okay, so that, 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 that speaks to independence. So for Hawaii, we know that Hawaiian Kingdom was an independent state in the 19th century, and it had a government that exercised that authority and that independence, right? And that was a constitutional monarchy, where Queen Lili'uokalani was the executive monarch. What happened in 1893, really simply, is they just changed the head of the government, the queen and her cabinet, replaced them with insurgents, Sanford Dole and the, his fellow criminals, and they were protected by the American Marines, right? And what you just had there was a regime change. And that Hawaiian Kingdom government then turned into an armed force for the United States. And everyone in government were forced to sign oaths of allegiance to that new regime. And that's where we have the song of Mele Aloha or Kalona Napua. Mm. Uh, the, the song of eating rocks. Don't sign the paper of the enemy with its sin of annexation. That's one of the lyrics. So, so we know in 1893, there was an illegal overthrow of a government, which was our government, admitted to by the United States. An agreement then entered into between President Cleveland and the Queen to reinstate her in her position, not the whole government, just put her back into that office, which he never followed through with. And then we know when we speed, five years, speed up five years later, 1898, Spanish-American War breaks out. They're unable to acquire Hawaii's sovereignty and independence. So the U.S. Congress passes a law during the Spanish-American War to annex Hawaii. Now that joint resolution is, an ex is, is a part of the national pattern of the United States. It's a congressional law. It's not international law, which is a law between nations. This is national law. <laughs> that joint resolution did not annex Hawaii, because it couldn't, because it's limited to U.S. territory, because of precisely that term, independence. <laughs> so that's why the Hawaiian Kingdom uh, could not annex Hawaii if it wanted to by passing a law. Well, the United States cannot pass a law annexing the Hawaiian Kingdom. So what you have from 1898 during the Spanish-American War, you're going to have the eventual takeover or replacement of the Hawaiian national pattern the national consciousness, okay? And that process is called denationalization. We are the evidence of it. The fact that we don't know anything about hmm. the Hawaiian Kingdom 
is the evidence of the denationalization, that our national character, any memory of our national character as a country has basically been obliterated. Now, this is different from the sovereignty groups out there. The sovereignty groups are claiming to be kingdoms. No, we're talking about a country here. <laughs> we're talking about a national pattern called the Hawaiian Kingdom that was fully recognized being independent by the United States and other countries since the 19th century. That pattern still exists, but it has been replaced yeah, or subsumed <laughs> by the American national pattern. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the use of the term genocide and the use of the term denationalization? What, what, how do they relate to each other? Okay, so denationalization is considered a war crime. And it was first identified, or the word coined, as a war crime in 1919, after World War I, because they're going to prosecute Bulgarians, Austrians, and Germans uh, for war crimes committed during occupations. But it's going to be coined in 1919, right? But if it's coined in 1919, then logically you would say that then you can only be prosecuted for war crime after 1919. See, and that's where the confusion comes. Actually, when this term was coined along with other uh, uh, war crimes, such as destruction of property, usurpation of sovereignty, when they created these terms, they said that these are not new terms. We're just codifying them. These are part of the principles of international law that existed at least since 1874, it's called the Brussels Conference where they first got together to try to codify uh, customary international law to regulate warfare, to regulate occupations. So denationalization, although it was coined in 1919, it actually was accepted as being a part of international law since at least 1874. So what's important there is what took place in 1893, there could be certain instances in 1893, January, that would constitute war crimes, even though it predates 1919. Okay. So denationalization, along with 32 other war crimes that was listed, um, uh, Professor uh, Lemkin, what he was proposing in his book was that denationalization should not be limited. It should be encompassing, because when you denationalize, you are attempting to kill a nation. That's denationalization, which would include banning the language of the occupied territory from being spoken, um, pushing your own legal system in violation of independence into that, into that territory you're occupying. So he said from a position of denationalization in its totality, he called that genocide. That's where he brought in the term. So he, 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 he coined another term to replace denationalization. And actually, um, there was a committee that was created during World War II that would look into prosecuting the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese for war crimes. So they began to take up these issues of what was going on during World War II. And they were coming to the same conclusion, this legal committee, committee number three, they're from the United Nations War Crimes Commission. They were coming to the same conclusion that Professor Lemkin was coming to in his book in 1944. And by 1945, this committee, which was made up of Americans, uh, scholars and uh, lawyers, they said that denationalization is genocide. And it was restated in one of the uh, U.S. military tribunals prosecuting uh, a German for occupation, and they said denationalization through genocide. Yeah. Well, genocide through denationalization. They said the words are synonymous. So that's the development of that word genocide under humanitarian law. Now, in 1948, after World War II, there was a convention that the United Nations put together, a treaty, to prevent genocide. You know, as looking back at what happened during World War II with the um, uh, uh, Auschwitz, yeah, the, the, the slaughterhouses. Now, that convention that the country signed to prevent genocide, that is a recognition of a human right. But if you're at war, 
that convention doesn't necessarily apply. What would apply is denationalization, which is genocide, according to Professor Lemkin and the legal committee that concluded and agreed with Professor Lemkin, committee number three, that denationalization in its totality is genocide. My guess is anybody who's watching this is going to have to watch it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. One of the things I'm you said. I'm trying to make it simple. I know, I know. So one of the <laughs> things you said, um, uh, national character. And I'm recalling something that Cleveland said when he was still the president. Um, something like um, a substantial wrong has been done, yeah. which we, by virtue of our national character, must endeavor to repair, which tells me that he thought at that time that the American national character, you know, whatever, would actually do the right thing. Exactly, would, it was based yeah. on truth, the rule of law. Right. So he said that was the American yes. way things are supposed right. to be. And I bet yeah. everybody during that time felt the same way. Yeah. They could describe themselves to others, people in other cultures, as, um, having this national character, which is, I think, really interesting. I, you know, like, where are they now? But that's just me. Yeah. Um, so yes, I can, I can understand why Hawaiians also had a national character. So every country in the world, uh, we're talking, like, I, I'm limiting that, that statement to countries that are recognized as independent states. Because you can still be a nation within a country, like the Navajo Nation. So that's a nation within a nation. Right. That may not have a national character. Oh, they still have saying? their. They still have a national character, yeah. That makes the Navajo unique unto itself. Mm -hmm. But it really has no meaning under international law because that is a law between independent states. So the national character of the Native Americans is supposed to be protected by American law, right? Now the national character of an independent state is supposed to be protected by international law, mm. right? So Italians, the country Italy, has a national character that is geopolitical, right? That is unique unto Italy itself. Um, the United States has a national character that is supposed to be unique unto itself. Canada has a national character. So the countries are supposed to be different and unique. And the primary difference would be language, right? So, um, uh, Italy speaks Italian, right? So that is part of Italy's national character. In fact, Professor Lemkin refers to language as culture, which is different because culture as we see it today is in dance, in, in um, presentation, <laughs> in, in, in yes. yeah, the hula, right? Under international law, that's not protected under international law. It's not protected, but the language is because you're talking about the entire country. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the hula may be only one aspect of the population. Yeah. So that's how culture within countries are still very important, but they're mm. different from the national culture of a country. That's different. <laughs> Anthropologists consider language as culture. Yeah. Language is culture because- Exactly. Well, in the denationalization and the changing of the language, for example, in Hawaii to English means that you begin to think in English yeah. and you begin to, to feel and just actually look at your environment and your surroundings and start to describe them in a language that is not yours. I can see how exactly. things change, people change, everything changed. And that is precisely denationalization because you're replacing one national pattern with another. So that language is so important because what Professor Lemkin saw was the Germans began to take over the schools and teach the children hmm. to speak German and not their national language. It was part of that, 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 that policy of denationalizing or obliterating any memory of some national consciousness that makes that country like Luxembourg unique. You know, so they would say, well, Luxembourg, you guys were always German to begin with. We're just making sure you realize that. Um, Italy did that. Italianization took place in Yugoslavia, okay? And they were actually, the Italians took over the schools, the public schools, just like here in Hawaii, and began to, uh, uh, they banned the, the, the language and they began to teach the children how to speak Italian. 
it was a move toward denationalization, implementing the policy. But it's important, though, to distinguish between what is protected under national law and what is protected under international law. So when you, zoom, when you zero in into the language, uh, that language is number one that makes that country unique. That is the voice of its national character. So that's what they were looking at in 1890, I mean, in uh, 1944. And, 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 and that's what Professor Lemkin was referring to as well in 1944. So for Hawaii, what you have to understand as well is that sometimes we keep looking at Hawaii through a very ethnocentric lens, a very native lens. Okay, Hawaii was a country, okay, fully independent. And the nationals of this country did not only include the native. We were the majority. We were 86% of the national population. But the 14% were non-native. They were Hawaiian. And that's where the terminology also is important. So the word Hawaiian that we use today is from an American national pattern. And it's ethnic <laughs> through the Hawaiian Homes Act of 1921. Mm. Now it's race-based. Okay, but that is an American national pattern created by the United States Congress. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, the term Hawaiian is a short term for the word Hawaiian subject. Like British is a short term for the word British subject. So you can be British and be black. You can also be Hawaiian and be black. It's a nationality. See, and that is the Hawaiian national pattern. Now, you can be Hawaiian of Aboriginal blood, right? which means you have Hawaiians that are not Aboriginal, such as Lauren Thurston, Sanford Dole. They weren't American. They were Hawaiian. They were Hawaiian subjects. They were born and raised in Hawaii, and their parents were Hawaiian. Well, Lauren Thurston's parents were Hawaiian subjects. Sanford Dole's parents were American, but he was born in Hawaii, so he was natural born. So when you start to see it within that f framework, you can now distinguish between the national patterns Many of us tend to get sucked into the American pattern, but trying to argue a Hawaiian angle. <laughs> so you're actually in the system that was the crime to begin with. Mm. But if you step back and you see the, you juxtapose, you put it side by side. First of all, what is the Hawaiian national pattern? And then you can see then what is the American national pattern. And that's when you can do some comparing contrasts. Right now we have a lot of people who don't understand these terms, and they're making arguments for Hawaii, for Hawaiians, within the American national pattern. Yeah? And they try to justify it when they are really just the evidence of the crime, because mm -hmm. it shows that they don't right. know the Hawaiian national pattern. Yep, and I think, you know, the majority of us fall into that category because we don't there. know. <laughs> yeah. So how do you re-nationalize? You can, right? Well, it's just, it's, a, it's consciousness. So what you do is you raise the consciousness. It never left. It's just that our memory of it has been obliterated. You can always recover your memory. <laughs> well, back to the, the thing about how you think, the language that you think in. Um, years and years ago, 20 years or so, uh, a friend of mine who was teaching Hawaiian language um, was concerned about the fact that there were a couple of schools and uh, teachers who were translating American primers into Hawaiian language. So it would be like see spot run in Hawaiian language and all that kind of stuff. And it, it was really um, anathema. They didn't like that at all because they understood what was happening in Hawaiian language programs where people were taught, they were taught to think in English, even as they were using the Hawaiian words, so evidence. I'm just bringing it up from memory. Well, when the yikes, when when our people began to bring back the language, uh, when they began to watch other people bringing back the language, like mm -hmm. the Maori yeah, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, mm -hmm. and the Kohanga Reo, which became our Punana Leo. Okay, we're drawing it from them, right? It wasn't an original thought here. <laughs> Uh, Native Americans were saying you should do this. So the creation or, or the basis for bringing back the Hawaiian language, it did not have any foundation 
in raising a Hawaiian national consciousness, which is a Hawaiian national pattern. It was raising the native consciousness as an ethnic group. And that's when it became very closed, very much only natives should speak Hawaiian, mm. okay? That was more of a, of a situation that was uh, arising, which we call in research, it's the Occidental versus the Oriental. It's the West versus the rest. So this pendulum swings to the extremes, right? That framework was not applied uh, with this understanding that we have now. So we have to be careful not to try to fit what we did in the past into this when it may not even fit. Now it may be, it may need to be adjusted, yeah, or tweaked. But when people say, oh, that's what we're doing. No, that's not what you're doing because only now we're coming up with this understanding of what is a Hawaiian national consciousness because Hawaiian now in the Hawaiian pattern is a nationality, not an ethnicity. Because you can call somebody a Hawaiian and he's Chinese back in the Kingdom era. But when you call somebody a Hawaiian today, you ask how much Hawaiian you? <laughs> What's your ethnicity? That's the American national pattern created by Hawaiian Homes Act 1921 that defined Native Hawaiian as 50% of the Aboriginal blood. So those are the things that we have to be careful about. But all in all, this is the evidence of the crime. <laughs> I would like to say that it's all clear, everything that you said, but for me it's kind of like, oh my God, I'm going to have to go home and actually think about all of this because I, I see the wisdom in it. I, I understand what you're saying. I also know that it's, it's not our fault. Yeah, yeah, I'm And, smart. you know, we just kind of like, I would like to stick it on somebody, but yeah. I wouldn't know how to do that. So then it comes down to ultimately, what does it mean for me and what am I required to do? I and mean, what is our kuleana? If you know this information, probably people don't want to, really don't want to know the information because it requires so much. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. And you know what happens when you ask the question? Maybe don't ask then. Because you ask the question, you're going to get an answer, and it just makes everything way more complicated. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say. Well, it's, it's education. So what you do is you address ignorance with knowledge. You know, so if, if we're raising the national consciousness, we have to base it on verifiable facts and not rhetoric. Because rhetoric is the art of convincing somebody, which normally that narrative doesn't have the right, the right facts. Yeah, it's always geared toward what you're trying to argue. This information has to be presented and taught, which it is. It's happening in the schools. I mean, I'm, I'm at the university. So it's not that we're trying to change people. Just educate, you know. And it's not like people don't need to know it or need to know it. It's just information. And as you start to raise the awareness of a national consciousness, you will naturally then get into your rights that you have. Uh, now you, one particular extension of Hawaiian national consciousness, Queens Hospital. Queens Hospital was created in 1859 to provide healthcare to Aboriginal Hawaiians, the natives, at no charge. That is something unique that only Hawaii can boast. Yeah? Other countries in the world, that was not part of their national consciousness. You needed to have money to have access to healthcare. If you don't have access to healthcare, probably because you didn't have enough money. That was in the 19th century as well. But here, part of the Hawaiian national consciousness that made it unique was that Queen's Hospital was a quasi-private public hospital. The monarch, the executive monarch, was the perpetual president of the board. Monies that the legislature would grant yeah, would go to Queen's Hospital. Okay. 1904, okay. Uh, the Deputy Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General in 1904 came out with his opinion from the Territory of Hawaii that the territorial government cannot continue to fund Queen's Hospital and have natives have health care with no charge because that is unlawful under American law because that's race-based. What you have right there is a collision between the Hawaiian national pattern and the American national pattern. That's genocide. 
That's part of denationalization. So from 1904, for every Hawaiian Aboriginal blood who went to Queen's Hospital for health care and paid, that's pillaging. They're going to a, 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 a hospital that was established for the very purpose of providing health care at no charge. And that was part of native tenant rights in the land. And so it's part of that other nation, that's Hawaiian national pattern. Very much uh, paternal, yeah? ali'i system where you take care. This was also incorporated into Hawaiian law called vested rights. See, now that's another example of the Hawaiian national pattern, right? Which was replaced by the American national pattern. And then you see that taking place throughout from the 1900s all the way through. And today, Mm. Uh, people talk about race-based um, um, legislation. That is an American national pattern. That's not Hawaiian. So we're thinking through the American eyes and through the American lens, when in fact, we have the wrong glasses on. <laughs> so all these things are coming to the fore. So when you start to realize that, wait a minute, Aboriginal Hawaiians, natives, that was our hospital. And that got, car that got hijacked. And that I've been paying Queens Hospital for healthcare when I didn't know it was supposed to be at no charge. Then I start to realize, well, then what do you call that? And the terminology used is, well, that's called pillaging. Robbery, the international word for robbery is pillaging. And pillaging is a war crime. Article 147, Geneva Convention. Pillaging, being an extension of denationalization, now we talk genocide. And one of the effects is not the wiping off or the killing, massive killings, but could lead to deaths. Well, you take a look at the, the natives, our people, and their health care today. Highest on every list. Diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure. That has a direct nexus to Queen's Hospital and the prevention of, uh, of health care at no charge because now natives have to go find money and if they don't have it then they don't go and the type of diseases that we are dealing with now we already dealt with the diseases of the 19th century which caused the creation of Queens Hospital such as measles smallpox those were having a decimating effect on the population of Aboriginal Hawaiians because of low immunity they put that to a halt Queens did yeah the type of health that we're suffering from, it's called just bad health. <laughs> no knowledge of why you don't eat so much mac salad, you know, so much spam, <laughs> you know. That's not a Hawaiian national pattern. That was an American national pattern placed on us on survival. So it's, it's, it's a very unique thing. You know one thing I like to also say about Queens Hospital in the Kingdom era? Did you know that in the kingdom, they had a problem with prostitution in Honolulu, okay? Because the ships would come in. Native women, prostitutes. They tried to regulate it, the legislature, penalize it. Wasn't working. They set up a policy now where prostitution was regulated by the Hawaiian government in the 1880s and 90s. And prostitutes, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian prostitutes, would go for free checkup at Queens to make sure they're okay. It was a means of preventive uh, measures. That is powerful. And I remember there was a group of uh, a women, professional women in the 1890s, who wrote a letter to the president, the, the, the chair of the board of trustees, and said, this is unacceptable. These prostitutes, you know, they are committing crimes. And Queens Hospital should not be doing this. And the response from that chair, he said, this hospital is for the country and we need to protect everyone in the country. And he said, he said, I know God would say that too. And that was a means of regulating. Very cool. It's progressive. But see, that's a Hawaiian national pattern. American national pattern, criminalize it. Right. You know, so, so, so these are other examples of juxtaposition, yeah, of compare and contrast. And uh, it's an exciting time to learn all this it is. It just gets you to ask more questions to get more answers. But it is true that we didn't lose anything. We just lost our memory. 
you can recover that. <laughs> mm, that uh, thing just popped into my head when you were talking. Houselessness, homelessness, um, and then being uh, criminalized for being poor and houseless yep. and homeless. Right. And just that's just me, but I, I think that lots of Hawaiians wonder why that should even happen. Right. Why is that happening here? I, my mother told me a story once because they lived, she grew up in um, Holualoa, Makai side. And so I said, where did, you do, where did you guys live? Did you own your own house? And she said, no. But she had cousins who had several houses. And if a house was empty, someone could go and live in it. So her father was a fisherman. And then they moved into that house. And they knew all the neighbors and they were relatives anyway. And I said, it was that as simple as all that? She said, yeah. That the houses were open, but anyone of the family who came by, they're welcome to take it. See, now that was a, and that would be a reaction to an American national pattern through a Hawaiian national consciousness. You care for your family. You take care. You take care of the person next to you. Okay, that, that was part of the kingdom era as well. What was also prevented by the American imposition of their national pattern was, did you know that under Hawaiian law, every Aboriginal Hawaiian is able to get land, a fee simple title called a kuleana under the 1851 Kuleana Act, 1850. That's still the, that was the law in the kingdom. Native Hawaiians were not landless. Now, after the takeover, yeah, we became landless, which created additional problems for health. We created problems with economics, with job opportunities. That's genocide. So that was another example. The fact that we don't have land and we're paying these huge amounts of monies for property in Honolulu at inflated value. That's not how it was. But that's the American national pattern. Mm -hmm. That's not the Hawaiian national pattern. So you're dealing with a lot of our people today that are surviving Barely. within the American national pattern. Yes. But it's not Hawaiian. It's not. I'm just saying that because I, I live in Waianae now, not too far from the, the harbor. Yeah. Show Hawaiians. Yeah. Um, and always wondering for myself, like, how, how did we get to this place, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of like makes me very upset. In fact, almost everything that you're saying is like making me really upset. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't be helped. <laughs> but you're right. If you open yourself up and you ask a question, then you need to be prepared for hearing the answer and then trying to figure out what to do now that you have, you have asked a question. Information has come your way, okay? Well, in my, in, in, in my experience, there are basically two types of people, and I'm going to be blunt. People may not like what I'm going to say, mm. but it's true, okay? You either are a decision maker or you're affected by decisions made. And sometimes when you think you're a decision maker, you're actually affected by decisions made. This information presents the situation here as who fixes the problem, right? Who's the decision maker or decision makers that can fix this problem? Well, I can tell you right off the bat, it's not us at this level. It's a pattern. So if it's a pattern that is recognized under international law, then who's responsible for the patterns, right? So the United States President, uh, Barack Obama, He's responsible for, for the commission of genocide here in Hawaii. And he would be considered complicit because his predecessors were the ones who were doing it. And it was the original predecessor, when it dealt with Hawaii, called Willie McKinney, that was the principal. He committed genocide. And that was recognized, the concept was recognized in 1898. He committed genocide when they took away and occupied it to build it up militarily and carry out the policies of denationalization disguised as if it was assimilation. See, assimilation is not denationalization. Denationalization is a war crime. Assimilation might be, a, uh, be an ethical problem <laughs> or a moral problem. It's not a violation of a law. Denationalization is. So he is the culprit right now that is gonna be, that is gonna be held responsible because he has to, he's in that position. And he can do something to fix the problem. If not, then he becomes complicit and an accessory. The other, and the other office, notice I'm speaking offices, not persons. Mm. The other office is the governor of the state of Hawaii. The state of Hawaii government that people don't realize, did you know that that's actually the Hawaiian government? That's the Hawaiian kingdom government. 
All that was changed in 1893 was the head, the queen and her cabinet, replaced by Sanford Dole and his cabinet. That so-called provisional government made a name change to the Republic in 1894. Then in 1900, the Congress made a name change, Territory of Hawaii. Then in 1959, the United States Congress passed another law, another name change, State of Hawaii. That's actually the Hawaiian government. So the, today, the Department of Land and Natural Resources is actually the Interior Department. The Department of Accounting and General Services, that's actually the Finance Department. <laughs> it's all there, all the courts in Hawaii, all these courts, these circuit courts from the Kingdom era, 1845. The Police Department, the National Guard, they're all from the Kingdom era. That's how so few people could take over an entire country. And then once they took it over, then they start the propaganda where they make it appear as if the territorial government or the state of Hawaii government is an American creation. So once you start to see it in that context, you're going, wait a minute, this is our government. And they made us believe it's not. <laughs> That's why you have the sovereignty movement trying to create something out of thin air. The best place to hide anything is right in front of you. And it's always been there. So when you start to see these things, Lynette, it starts to make sense. And the key is how do you fix the problem, not how you exacerbate it. So I'm not here to exacerbate the problem. But there is a certain awareness that has to be understood so that when change does come from a decision maker, which will affect decisions made, ultimate change. So when you go back to 1893, we're basically just turning it, instead of it going right with the military, with the takeover, now it's gonna go left. That governor's office, that's the office of the monarch. It's a chief executive office. That's what Queen Lili Ukulani was. Those are the kind of things that we need to understand. Yeah, and the ideas of genocide, war crimes, they're gonna be used to, um, uh, as leverage to fix this problem. Because when people start to feel the, the heat, that these are real issues, then you're really gonna want a decision maker to make some decisions mm. and a decision that is lawful and maintainable <laughs> and not somebody just saying something, you know, so. These are good things to think about because I think what happens is <clears throat> we have enough information to figure out where we want to situate ourselves with the expectation that something's gonna happen down the road. Certain changes will come about. It's kind of like once you raise consciousness, it's not like you can lower it. Yeah. I mean, once people get it, they yeah. can't unget it. Um, so you make some assumptions that things are moving along and, and the more information you have, the more you're able to figure out where do you situate yourself in the future because this information is coming. Yeah. It can't stop. I mean, it's just, it's happening and so that's, it's gonna change everybody. So what is, what is the best thing for us to do considering the fact that change is going to come? I think about this all the time, by the way, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Well, it's just, we gotta get ready. Yeah. And <laughs> Change comes through the national pattern, in our case. Um, just as change was made in 1898, a national pattern. So we had to figure out, my great-grandparents had to figure out, how does this American system work? You know, do we need to get elected officials to Washington? Okay, well, how do we do that? Okay, let's create the Democratic Party. Okay, Democratic Party, principles of Jefferson strict adherence to the Constitution. That was David Kawananakua that created the Democratic Party here. Did you know their argument was, you cannot annex a foreign territory by passing a law. That is Jeffersonian philosophy, <laughs> strict interpretation of the Constitution. So they were using these to address the issue, right? But then as time progressed, as the control was firmly held, we had to survive. And that's when we just had to live by this national pattern. Now living in this illegal national pattern does not make it lawful, right? It's like being kidnapped. You're being forced to survive and you're doing whatever the kidnapper tells you. By being forced to survive and listening to the kidnapper did not make you adopted, right? You're still kidnapped, <laughs> but now it's psychological. So how we get out of that is we need to normalize this information. So when we speak of the Hawaiian kingdom, it's the country. It's not a group, yeah? When we talk about Hawaiian subjects, it's a nationality, it's not an ethnicity. When we talk about language, when we talk about denationalization, those are important terms to know, but we gotta mm. get used to it. Yes. And like we say in Hawaiian, 
just get mild with it. You know, it's okay. <laughs> well, one of the things I know is changing is this idea of referring to the United States as a mainland. I mean, it's a small thing, right? But every time I, I read it, every time I have a conversation with someone who says, yeah, we're gonna go to the mainland, and it's always like a correction. You're going to the U.S., right? <laughs> you, know, you just and, say and, that. And, and, you, and you know who coined the word mainland? No. Sanford Dole. Well, smart dude. Yeah, because he coined the word mainland in order to entice Americans co to come to Hawaii. <laughs> that, he was encouraging migration. He, he used the word mainland. And today we use it. See, that's another word we gotta change. Yes. Another word, uh, uh, we're colonized. No, that's the American narrative. You know, that's, you're promoting what they said happened here. Because mm -hmm. when you colonize, that implies you're not a country. So if you're mm -hmm. not a country, then that means you never had a national pattern. So what's your argument? I mean, like, what are you guys doing then? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so occupation is what you're supposed to use. Now when you use occupation, now you're getting into war crimes. Yes. Now, see, now we can talk about genocide within humanitarian law and not speak about genocide as a human rights law, as we used to before, you know? Because massive killings is a war crime itself. It is, it's a war crime, mass killings. So you didn't need to create the word genocide under humanitarian law to make that a war crime. It was already a war crime since 1919. That's why Professor Lemkin in 1944 said, genocide is systemic. It, it, it's based on a pattern of oppression, not upon a specific kill or killing or killings. Yeah. This is so useful. Yeah. <laughs> useful, it's a thinking thing for me, right? So it's like a thought problem and I gotta go home and for the rest of the day think about what all of this kind of means to me and because I'm teaching again in the fall. Okay. And then trying to figure out how to introduce this kind of stuff and I, I'm sure there's teachers watching. Yeah. And my guess is that as soon as they get a handle on what you just said and do their own research and check it out, that it might be useful to actually begin to introduce these ideas in the school system. Because you know, we're, they, we can do what they did. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so we just, just reverse do it. what they yeah, did. Reverse it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that there are students coming up who will find themselves to me eventually that I don't have to teach because they'll already know it. Yeah. And they'll be instituting uh, uh, a new national consciousness. Or an old up. one. <laughs> or an old one. <laughs> We're recovering our old, our yeah. original national consciousness. Yeah, so it's all pretty exciting. Well, there's a blog, as you know, hawaiiankingdom.org slash blog. Mm -hmm. A lot of up-to-date information there things that are very current. Uh, issues of terminology uh, is up to the, the purpose of the blog is to expose, but base it upon facts, mm. base it upon reliable information that can be verified and quantified and qualified. Do you find academics in general supportive of, of this way of thinking? Can you just raise the issues, bring it forward? Um, well, I think academics if they stick to being an academic, they shouldn't have a problem because <laughs> it's, it's, this hits all the, uh, the methodology, mm -hmm. theoretical framework, and information that can be falsified. Okay, that's what research is. Research is, can you falsify this information? When a person gets a PhD, as you know, or a master's, they don't argue their master's degree. They don't argue their PhD, they defend it. They're defending it from professors on their committee that are trying to falsify it. Mm -hmm. So if they stick to the aspect of falsification, they shouldn't have a problem. But once the academics start to now get into politics and they start to push an agenda, see, then they get into rhetoric, not research. And the rhetoric is the art of convincing and becoming very selective with historical facts, which is confirmation bias. You Why? confirm your own bias. Why? It's personal. They, they've left the academy to be politics. They, 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 they're trying to argue. That is not what we should do as academics. We should teach, you know, and we should in encourage research on this. Right. That's what we should do. We shouldn't have an agenda other than being a good academician, since we're academics ourselves. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I don't see it happening, um, unfortunately. I'm always looking yeah. for new research that's coming up because I want to, I want people to talk about what they're doing in their research and they're so excited about it anyway. And it's new, well, it's the whole point, right? It's new. Right. And yet I'm not sure whether the University of Hawaii anyway is actually encouraging they're not. that kind of. I'll be upfront, they're not. And you know why? It's an extension of uh, uh, genocide. Here's the connection. 
research is based upon money. You gotta get grants, right? So you get grants to talk more about Native Hawaiians as indigenous people than getting a grant to do research on Hawaii status as an occupied state or whether or not Hawaii's government was overthrown as opposed to its state. So what ends up happening is the American national pattern reinforces oh themselves here. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much what it is. It's, it, it, University of Hawaii is, is a research base. Let's just maintain the status quo, status quo. Let's just don't rock the vote. That's what it comes down to. Well, that's what some people may think on their own, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, I, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you know, you might say when I got my PhD, I was going against the grain on yeah. everybody's mind. But the key is, it's 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 information, and we owe this to our country, mm -hmm. we owe it to our past, not our present, to make it right. Well said, and mm -hmm. we were like right out of time, out of time Perfect. right now. Thanks, Keanu, for being here and for for sharing your thoughts. And I think we should do this more often because. Sure. Now I'm thinking. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us, and um, we'll see you again.